Mr. Speaker, let me first of all thank my colleagues, particularly the, the member for Grosely, who had to be summoned back to capital on his birthday rendezvous. I want to thank him for putting country first. He being a young politician, a young minister, could not see himself missing such an opportune opportunity to speak, to take part in this historic moment in this honorable house. Mr. Speaker, as I sit and reflect on my time in politics, and I sit and reflect on what has transpired, where I've been, what has happened to me, how I've progressed from a nothing in politics, from someone who could never win the seat, someone who could never, ever, ever be in parliament, someone who would never, ever, ever be a minister, not even a prime minister. And I see how this process has developed. I remember the pain of election losses. I remember the pain of defeat and the glory of victory. I remember that day in 1997, when Kenyan, when the member for Viewford South and 16 others, this historic 16-1 victory, when all of us were very young, when all of us were motivated and led by Kenny Anthony to this historic victory. And I see where we are today and where I am today. I have a lot to thank God for. I have to thank God. I have to thank my parents, although some people don't want me to say that. I have to thank my colleagues. I have to thank the members of the St. Lucia Labour Party. And more particularly, I have to thank the men and women of this cabinet. But Mr. Speaker, I am perturbed by what I see developing in the politics of St. Lucia. Here we have a debate on arguably one of the most important moves in St. Lucia's history. A constitutional debate on removing St. Lucia from the shackles of the Privy Council to the Caribbean Court of Justice, a regional institution, Mr. Speaker. And the level of debate that I see and I'm meeting from the opposition is painful. It's a debate of character assassination. The names of serious jurists, the names of global figures, the name of a former president of the Caribbean Court of Justice, the name of someone who's got involved at the highest level of jurisprudence is being dragged into the gutter of Facebook by the United Workers Party, accusing him of bidding to the Labour Party. Mr. Speaker, what example do we give to our children when we cannot, when we cannot go above, we cannot rise to the moment, we cannot meet destiny face to face when these important things are happening, Mr. Speaker. When I see another man who has got himself into a position because he is the president of the OECS Bar Association, being dragged again into the gutters, being called all kind of names, being, being blast, being defamed on Facebook, just because he happens to be an associate or friend of somebody in the Labour Party. Mr. Speaker, it's a real sad day. And I think our society should reject it. I think our civil society to speak against these things, Mr. Speaker, because I sit 
And I say, it's not about me, but it's about the example that we are setting to our children, the example we are setting to the young people of St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker, when we get involved in that level of, for a better word, Mr. Speaker, of nastiness. Mr. Speaker, what has the Caribbean Court of Justice got to do with somebody who is a friend to somebody in the Labour Party? What has the Privy Council got to do, Mr. Speaker, with someone who has a case in front of the Privy Council now? Why are we selling ourselves short, Mr. Speaker, when what we are doing is connecting to our destiny, taking ourselves away from one position and going to another, Mr. Speaker. Why do we have so little faith in ourselves as a people, Mr. Speaker? Why can't we, as Bob Marley said, liberate ourselves from mental slavery? Why aren't we confident in ourselves, Mr. Speaker? We've got the best. The, 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 this generation, Mr. Speaker, or this civilization, our West Indian civilization, Western civilization, has turned out some of the best, Mr. Speaker, some of the best artists, some of the best academics, Rex Nettleford, Alpha Lewis, Derek Walcott, um, Kyle Thomas, Tesford Georges, some of the best, Mr. Speaker. Some of the best have come out of our region, but we have no faith in it, we attack it, we condemn it, and refuse to see that a time has come when we can no longer hang on to our colonial past, Mr. Speaker. But how could we think different when a former prime minister can say that colonialism has a conscience? What do we expect from his followers if that's the example that he sets, Mr. Speaker? So instead of we debating, or instead of we trying to educate our people as to why it's going to be cheaper, why is it going to be better? Why is it going to be more accessible for us to be able to get justice, the justice that we claim that we want? Through the Privy Council, through the Caribbean Court of Justice, we want to soil it with propaganda and we want to soil it with politics, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, I'm heartened. I'm heartened because when I see the reaction of the young people who were there today, when I see the reaction, when I see how they sat and they absorbed the, 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 the discussion and the presentation of the member for, for Viewfort South, Mr. Speaker, when I saw the thirst, the anxiousness in their eyes to absorb the knowledge that was coming from the member for Viewfort South, I'm heartened, Mr. Speaker. I'm heartened because I know that the young people of this country, the young people of this country, Mr. Speaker, they know very well what is right and what is wrong, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I want to quote from a, a saying by Martin Luther King when he said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of brutality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whenever affects one, directly affects all indirectly, Mr. Speaker. And that is why it's important that justice is accessible to everyone. And that is what this, pre this Caribbean Court of Justice will do, will do, Mr. Speaker. We heard, we heard that even the filing fields sometimes will be free. How many people who were demonstrating this afternoon can find 2,500 pounds just to begin a process in the Privy Council? Just to begin a process, not just to begin it, 2,500 pounds. How many of them out there can afford it, Mr. Speaker? But you think their leader will tell them that? Because he can afford it. Because he can afford it? He will not tell them that they will never be able to afford it. And he will not tell them that possibly their relatives who may be at Baudelaire, who may be there because they are on remand, because they cannot meet bail, who may be there, may be there innocently, may be, Mr. Speaker, with the Caribbean Court of Justice, when the process continues, has gone through, they may be able to get justice through the Caribbean 
court of justice, which they could never afford to get in the Privy Council. Never. They could never be able to afford it, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, that is what we are not telling the people of this country. We're not speaking the truth to them, Mr. Speaker. We talk about poll judges are going to be appointed by politicians. There is no way, there is nothing in the agreement. It is almost impossible for a politician to choose a judge, Mr. Speaker. But we listen to CNN every night, and we have about Trump judges and Biden judges, and we accept it. We accept Trump judges, and we accept Biden judges. We think it's right for the Americans to be able to say that judges were appointed directly by a politician, so much so that the opinions and the judgments that he will give will come directly from the, the philosophies of the Republican Party. We are proud, and we say that's a developed civilization because we have, they are from America, and they have Trump judges. We can sit and we can observe that in the Supreme Court, the highest court in the United States, people can say that judgments will come from one set of judges because they are conservative judges and the other judges are liberal judges. So when an issue like what's happening now, the issue of student loans in front of the Supreme Court, people can predict that the liberal judges will go one way and the conservative judges will go another way. But we can never, we can never in the Caribbean Court of Justice ever say that one judge is liberal or one judge is, is, is conservative. Never. Because all of them are chosen because for other reasons, not by votes, direct votes by politicians. We can accept that. We can accept it because it comes from North America. We can accept it. That's good. But we can tell our people here that because the people that we, that we will choose as judges, people we know, people who look like us, people who went to the same schools as us, we can say they are not suitable. Where there is no evidence that a politician will choose them. There is no evidence, absolutely no evidence. But don't accept them, don't trust them, because they are chosen like by people. They are people that we know. They are people who went to the same school with us. They are people who went to the same university as us. Don't, don't trust them. Don't trust them. But we can trust Trump judges and Biden judges. Mr. Speaker, that is where we are. And it's very sad. It is very sad, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, as I said earlier, when I, when I introduced the, this bill, I said that this process started with a member for Viewfort South, outlined it, Mr. Speaker, and he, in his own style, Mr. Speaker, made some significant points, some significant contribution on the process, the historical process, Mr. Speaker. And I want to read a letter from the right, from the right honorable P.J. Patterson, the former prime minister of of Jamaica, Mr. Speaker, the most his, his exact his exact title is Mr. Speaker, the most the most honourable P.J. Palin. And he said, and he on a letter written to me on the fifth of February, Mr. Speaker, he said to me, trust that you will have a straightforward passage to the legislature, but please remember the vital importance of a concurrent public information program so that the electorate is fully locked in. And he further said, Mr. Speaker, fortunately, and that's his quote, Kenny was the CARICOM chair responsible for the creation of the CCJ and has all the background material necessary to answer, quest to answer any questions which might arise. Should there remain any area which requires a sharing of the unique Jamaican experience that can be readily supplied on request, continuing best wishes for successful passage. Um, so Mr. Speaker, when I get to work tomorrow, I will write the right excellent to the right honorable Peter Parson and tell him Kenny did give us a lot of his knowledge and we will pass the bill this afternoon based on the debate, Mr. Speaker. 
So, Mr. Speaker, we today, this afternoon, or this evening, we are part of history. And the history books will, will, will record that on the 28th day of February, St. Lucia broke from one of the shackles of colonialism, Mr. Speaker. And I'm sure, and hopefully, the other shackle, the other shackle, Mr. Speaker, we will also liberate ourselves from the other shackle very, very, very shortly, Mr. Speaker. Because our civilization, our country deserves it, Mr. Speaker. Our people deserve it, Mr. Speaker. The next, step, the next stage, Mr. Speaker, is in the process, we will write the British government and tell them what transpired, as, it, as I said in the letter. And all the cases that are, now pre that are now in the Privy Council, they will continue. All the cases that are now that are there at this moment, so all the propaganda here is not true, that they will continue, Mr. Speaker. And then any new cases, new cases, will proudly march to the Caribbean Court of Justice, Mr. Speaker, where we are going to be judged by people who know us where we are going to be judged by people who know the Caribbean experience, Mr. Speaker. Because I'm not a lawyer, but law is a product of the society, Mr. Speaker. Lawyers know what's happening. The judges are people who live in the society. They understand, this, they understand the nuances of our society, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank you. I want to thank the members of this parliament, Mr. Speaker. It's a pity, Mr. Speaker, it's a sad day that a former Prime Minister is not in this honorable house to debate such an important constitutional amendment, Mr. Speaker. It's very sad. It shows you the contempt and the scorn that he has for the people of this country. That if I'm not there, if I'm not the boss, I take my ball and I go. Because I must be the boss. I must be the boss. And Mr. Speaker, somebody told me that there was a discussion in New York where the gentleman said, if there was somebody who could run the country, he would resign. You want to believe that? If, if they could find somebody who could run the country, he would resign. So there's nobody. There's nobody in St. Lucia who can run this country, so he must stay. Even though the people kick him, he must stay. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. I thank Dr. Kenny, the member for Miku South, Mr. Speaker. So he was South. My apologies. What's up? <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> My apologies again. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for V for South, Mr. Speaker. That journey, as I said, he signed the document in 2001. And where we are today, as I, this Labour Party is a stream, it flows. And now it's our turn to bring it to the end to its end, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, let us enjoy this moment. Let us reflect on the, serious, the seriousness of this moment. Let us reflect on the significance of this moment, Mr. Speaker. Let us say to ourselves, we trust our people. We trust our judges. We trust the judges, Mr. Speaker. And together, this St. Lucian and West Indian civilization will survive, will survive, and, and will take our people to higher and better heights. I thank you, Mr. Speaker.